Weight on the bar is just a way to control your effort. So if there's a spectrum of weights that all can work. And there's a spectrum of techniques that all can work on various lifts. And there's nothing wrong with being competitive with yourself and saying, I really want to get this. It's just being honest with yourself. If your training stimulus, so what you do in isolation in one specific session is what causes progressive overload. All right, so I'm going to kick things off talking about one of my favorite videos of the year, which was Alan's video on the 10 commandments you should obey on your fitness journey. One of my favorite commandments is going all in, and this quote really sticks out. Go all in with powerlifting. Go all in with bodybuilding. Go all in with your fitness journey. Don't be a weekend warrior. Don't view exercises and fitness as a chore that's at the bottom of the barrel that you dread doing. You need to buy in and go all in on this stuff. Uh, so I'm curious, Landon, actually, what are your thoughts on maybe that quote and going all in and what's been your experience with it? So for me, I've, I kind of had the same philosophy, my whole thing. I don't know if I've talked about this a whole ton on the channel, but I basically needed to kind of adopt that mindset to make the gains that I wanted to, especially when I first started lifting. So when I was a kid or maybe not a kid, but when I was about 17, 18 or whatever, started, started off lifting in the gym. I was like, you know what? I really had no confidence that I would have the ability to get big. I was like, oh, I'm stuck in my skinny body and I'll never be big and strong. So I had this kind of unrelenting determination to prove myself wrong. And that's really what motivated me to continue with it and get big. So I was like, there's nothing that's going to get in my way. I don't care what it is. Lifting's my number one priority. And I picked lifting over uh, basically anything, including school and maybe not the smartest thing for everybody, but I think that just goes to show that having it as a higher priority, you don't have to be a psycho like I am, but having it probably as your second or third priority, at least for phases of your life can do a lot for you. And when your life kind of revolves around lifting, it makes the process objectively much easier. It's much easier to stay focused. It's much easier to justify uh, lifting even in times when most people wouldn't, like a certain busy day, busy week, whatever. Uh, and you you find ways to make it happen. I'm not saying you have to do that forever. And I didn't do that forever. But it absolutely taught me that you can make things happen. It's just about how high it is on your priority list. Great. And uh, Alan, maybe you want to talk more about that quote in that video and kind of what you were thinking about when you kind of said that all in method. Yeah, some of my fondest memories of lifting weights was when I went all in, uh, particularly in my early 20s, and uh, to where you just become obsessed with something. It's just so much more enjoyable to really go all in and uh, just let it like almost take over your life. And I was at a point to where I didn't have a mortgage, I didn't have a wife or a girlfriend, I didn't have kids. Um, so I just had to show up for my job. After that, I could just do whatever I wanted with this new hobby. And I think once you view lifting weights or powerlifting, bodybuilding, strongman, whatever it is, as a hobby or as your main interest, it's it's a lot more enjoyable. Um, and people will ask, just because my training has evolved over the past you know couple of decades, um, you know, do you regret bulking so hard, or do you do you wish you had done these exercises at this time, or do you wish you had approached things differently? And my answer is always no, not at all. Because at the time, that was just what I wanted to do. Whatever, whatever phase of training I was in, I was just all in. And it really clears up a lot of uncertainty that people tend to have. When you go all in, you don't wonder, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? You know, what's the best way to do this? You just get obsessed with whatever you're doing, whether that's powerlifting, bodybuilding, and the like. I think that some people that kind of want to dip their toes into a little bit of everything or should I be doing this? Is this best? Should I do that? What's optimal? It's almost the opposite, paralysis by analysis. Um, but I think going all in, you're just focused on the task at hand. Uh, whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter. It's just, uh, it, I think it's it's good to have those phases, especially when you're when you're younger. Yeah, I feel like going all in has its advantages, but not even just going all in on like fitness in general and dedicating your life. But it's like stick to a program, like pick a program that you're excited about and stick with it especially if you're new, don't always look for the shiny object. Don't always look to optimize, like do a program for like 
four months, six months, eight months, 12 months, and just kind of milk it and learn about yourself, right? You can learn what worked, what didn't work. But I think just picking something, even if it's not optimal early on and just going for it has its advantages. It's uh, similar to you just interviewed Yvonne when he said uh, that he he thinks training every day is easier than training three days a week. Kind of a similar concept. When you go all in, you just made up your mind. You made a decision already. You don't have to make decisions based off of emotions or the weather or anything like that. You're you're all in. You've made up your mind. This is what you're going to do. So I think it's good to have those phases. Uh, but well, I'm sure we'll talk about it. But once that phase is up, once it's time to move on, uh, I think it's important to move on at that point. But you'll know when it comes. Nice. Landon, anything you want to add? Um, not not particularly. I would just say com- there, there's a fear of commitment. And that's that's ultimately what holds people back, as you guys were kind of just saying. If you're afraid to commit to something because you're worried about not doing so, or mi- about missing out on something that could be a little bit better, I think you're kind of missing the forest for the trees at that point. And it's better to just commit to something that is a 9 out of 10 instead of wait around for something that is a 10 out of 10. I understand that mindset because I was there before, too. Uh, I remember being that beginner that's desperate for gains and when you aren't kind of on that other side and you understand the patience and the process and all the ups and downs that kind of come with it you don't you don't have that patience when you're maybe younger or earlier in the process so um it really is just trying to override those emotions and say i know there probably is something better but the best thing i can do is commit to something that i know is good uh, that will ultimately do more for you. And throughout the process of a program that's an 8 out of 10 instead of a 10 out of 10, uh, you'll probably learn how to make a 10 out of 10 program by the time you commit to that and learn what works and what doesn't work from it. For sure. I think especially when you're younger, it makes sense to go all in because you're still kind of developing your identity and who you are. So if you can just really focus on like, I'm a lifter, I love bodybuilding, I love this hobby, then it's going to be a lot easier down the road when maybe you don't have that time to dedicate the same level. But because you've kind of built that habit and that core identity, it is kind of like automatic training and eating a certain way. Yeah, and it there's something about losing that too that is uh it's a little bit scary like you never want to be the guy that's like obsessed with lifting and does everything perfect when he's has the time and when he's younger and whatnot and then as you get older and maybe you have more responsibilities or you want to try new things it's like you never want to be the guy that's like oh i kind of gave up on lifting you always want to you always kind of want to be a go i still got it like i can still get up early and get a lift in or work around my vacation schedule or i don't care if i have to work late i'll still get a lift and even if it's not perfect and i don't want to do it like you never want to lose that Uh, You don't want to lose that little bit of a chip on your shoulder, I guess. And I know you took a break from training like once upon a time for a while, uh, Landon. Mm -hmm. Maybe just talk through like, how did you lose that if you were so into lifting at the time? Oh, I was just brutally cynical. I was, I think I was 20, I'm trying to remember my age. I must have just turned 22. It was like four years ago or something, but Basically, I was so, so, so deep into Instagram and social media and whatnot. And it is so incredibly vain. And it just burned me out completely because I hated everybody that I was following subconsciously and didn't know that. I had a lot of jealousy, a lot of envy. And part of me was always like, why why don't I have those genetics? Like, why am I power building and I'm seeing this perfect physique and why don't I look like that? And ultimately, I would just kind of blame like my genetics. And I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and I stopped growing and I eventually just plateaued. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I can't take this anymore. Like these people that I'm following, I, I don't, I'm not even aware of the fact that I don't, I can't stand these people. They're just, they're like vain kind of narcissistic influencer types. And they kind of burned me out because I was trying to become someone like that when I was what, 18, 19, 20, 21, obviously it caught up to me when I was a little bit older And I was just completely sick of the fitness industry. I was completely burned out from influencers. I was completely burned out from being a follower and following what the fitness industry told me to do, like power building and focus on the big three, do your three by 10 curls after they don't matter, stuff like that. That was very prevalent in kind of the little sphere online that I was following. And 
I, I kind of snapped out of that, took my time away, rejuvenated my mindset and came back with this YouTube channel. And that's that's pretty much the story. It's still kind of early on, but that's where I'm at. Yeah, I actually wonder if there's like more pressure as an early lifter now because there's so much information and so much optimization. Like when I first started lifting, it was kind of like lift weights, pick a rep range you like, go have fun with your friends. And that's by no means optimal. But I was just watching like GVS's Q&A and there was someone that was saying like, I've been lifting for four months and I have bad chest insertions. And like, I was definitely not thinking about my insertions that I'm not really thinking about it now, um, let alone really early in my journey. So um, I don't know if I have much there. I just find that interesting. It is. The the genetics thing is wild. Uh, how much people start to pretend like it, like it matters. And it's equally as delusional to say it doesn't matter. But when you talk about like predicting your potential when you're four months into lifting, that is insanity in my personal opinion sometimes i'll think back to about genetics when i first started lifting in high school and it was serious lifting it wasn't like just you know dicking around in the gym um, but there were certain things that i look back on that i would get uh, it was almost good that i was naive to genetics i didn't understand that at all um, for example my bench has always been weak and uh, so when we go in the weight room with the other football players a lot of the bigger guys uh, that outweighed me by like 80 pounds, a lot of the big linemen would always bench more than me. Um, and just simply because they're a heavier body weight, they probably would bench more than me, uh, by default. And I would just get, I would just get like, man, I really want to bench this much. I want to out bench them. And it would push me to just bench more, uh, and push myself harder. I never thought, well, you know, they're heavier body weight than me. So their bench is going to be by default better. So I think it was good to have to be somewhat naive to that and not have someone telling me, well, it's because you're thinner or your genetics or maybe your response to training is not the same as them. So it was, it was nice to be naive. <laughs> That's a really good way to sum it up too, just being naive to that entire concept. Because then it, even if you look at your case, you're like, what am you self-reflect? You're like, what am I doing wrong? And how can I get to that? Because I want it so bad. Instead of just having that little lazy excuse kind of hanging around in the back of your head that some youtube channel told you is is a valid excuse like genetics or something or even a body weight ratio to justify you being weak and yeah of course someone that's 80 pounds stronger is pretty much always going to bench more than you but you can close that gap if you're not aware of those excuses so i think uh i i think it's it's obviously useful to be realistic but it's also useful in some cases to yeah kind of be naive to some things like that it's a good point yeah yeah, I think it is useful to be naive because I feel like the goals you achieve, you need to have a you need to have the right level of self-confidence to achieve that goal. And sometimes if you don't actually know how hard the goal is, you just kind of grind and chip away at it and it does it's less scary because you don't know how hard it is. Yeah, it's a weird thing. Funny you say that. Just quick little side story. So this past weekend on Saturday, I hiked a I hiked Mount Katahdin with my fiance and then um, her brother and, and his lady. But basically, uh, we were stuck in a cloud the entire time. So it, it's a mile high hike. It's a little over five miles in distance. We took a trail called the Hunt Trail and we were in a cloud the whole time. So we never knew how steep we were going, how far we were going. And it didn't start to clear up until the way down. So I think that that analogy of what you were just saying, Barun, that just instantly reminded me of that hike where by the time we got halfway down, I looked back and I'm like, there's no way, <laughs> no possible way I just did that. But since I couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of me the whole time, it kind of made it made it happen without my worry of how far it would be or my fear of heights start to like kind of override that. So I, I was naive in a sense on that hike, even though it took 12 hours. For sure. If you if you read everything about that hike and how dangerous it is, you might have more anxiety when you're doing it. Oh, that morning I woke up and my gut was in a knot. I was like, I looked at Liv, who's my fiance, and I was like, yeah, I don't have a good feeling about this. Like, all the reviews are crazy. Like, people are saying this isn't for the faint of heart. Like, you need to be an experienced hiker. This is the closest thing it gets to rock climbing. In, in, real, in all reality, it was totally fine. Like, yeah, it was steep and whatnot, but there was nothing that was, like, that scary. You, unless you were to do, like, the knife's edge or something, which I would never in a million years do uh but 
it, it was fine. It was totally fine, I'd say. Awesome. All right, I'm going to move on here. So I really enjoyed the interaction between the two of you regarding progressive overload and when you should add weight to the bar. Something that resonated with me is when Alan said, the specific weight does not matter as much as the effort you put forth. The weight on the bar is just a way to match the desired effort. And then Landon, you had a great analogy about using the right tool and that you need to run a marathon. You don't drive the marathon. Um, so I guess, Alan, can you talk about when to add weight to the bar and what you were trying to get across in that video in as much detail as possible? Yeah, so I think I in that video, I had mentioned just a very simple scale to start of easy. It's something I use with my own personal training clients in person. It's a little harder to convey over the internet or email online clients, but in person, I'll ask, you know, was that easy? Was that moderately challenging or was that hard? Just to get a sense of what their idea of hard is. And if they're lifting a hundred pounds and they say, man, this is, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, I'm not going to look at them. You know, I might put some encouragement, but I'm not going to tell them, oh, that wasn't hard. I'll show you hard. It's just, that's their perception of hard. And uh, if they lift a hundred pounds today and they say it's hard and, you know, in a month or two, they're lifting a hundred pounds, same weight. So they haven't forced any weight on the bar, but they're like, Hey, this is like moderately difficult. This is noticeably easier. Um, that would be a metric of progression. Even though we haven't added weight to the bar, it is getting easier, subjectively easier. And we're not like threading the needle and saying it went from an, a 9.5 to an RP nine. Um, but just easy, medium, hard, easy, moderately challenging, hard. And so that's kind of the, the scale that I use for beginner lifters, uh, when I first start working with them. And then, uh, something else that I mentioned that you mentioned about, uh, weight on the bar is just a way to control your effort. So if I wanted to be in the eight to 10 rep range and I wanted to go to failure, I'm just using whatever weight allows me to get to that intensity or that effort. Um, not worrying so much about this has to be a hundred pounds. It has to be 110 pounds. Last week I did 110 pounds. So this week should be the same or more just kind of stepping away from that and just focusing on the effort. If you're going to failure, just use scale the weight on the bar just to accommodate the goal. I'm just trying to get in that eight to 10 rep range and I'm trying to go to failure. And so just adjusting the weight that way is, uh, just an easier way to think about it. I think. Land in your thoughts. Yeah. So if we're talking about, uh, overall progressive overload, I'd say focus on, yeah, first zoom out, look at the big picture. And from there, I would say it's also important to realize that, uh, it, and this is just to kind of relieve some of the anxiety of the guys that are so hyper fixated with progressive overload. There's a spectrum of weights that all can work. And there's a spectrum of techniques that all can work on various lifts. So if you need to do a little weight reset and kind of change your technique, that's that's ultimately okay because you don't have to keep stepping forwards every time in terms of just weight on the bar and reps that you're doing. I think a lot of people will chase certain numbers and my the way I built my channel was kind of just talking about that whole concept. But uh, what I would say is if you're someone that's in, say, the same shoes that I was years ago, which, which a lot of people are, I've come to realize since starting the channel talking about that whole concept is... Uh, it's okay to take a step back and you're not going to lose progress. The way that the people that have that progressive overload anxiety think is they have to do more each time to cause growth. And if they don't do more and they do something they're already adapted to, they're at best going to plateau or at worst, they're going to lose size because they're not actively building more muscle. So if you're say trying to progress like your bench press for a very simple example, if you're at like 225 for five, and you don't do 225 for six next time that there's people that think they're plateaued in that case. And I was one of those people. So what I would do is do whatever I could to get that sixth rep. And I was focused specifically on the performance metric aside from technique technique. I completely ignored and I would allow myself to manipulate for that sixth rep. So obviously we're all experienced lifters. So you know, those little things like uh, using cues to, out make you press more weight so driving your your upper back into the pad using a wider grip so a setup change using more leg drive uh raising your butt just a little bit off the bench pad 
uh, you can use a bigger arch. You can speed the eccentric, then you can eventually bounce the eccentric, then you can pause between reps. And I could go on forever, but those are all little things you can progressively overload with. And that that's just you're you're missing the bigger picture if you're using that that approach. And I'm not saying you can't get any size or anything training like that, but what you're doing is you're slowly degrading your technique to where you are going to be getting less stimulus on the target muscle each rep. So it's fine for now. It will get worse over time. But what you need to realize is your technique and your performance are related to each other. So if you want to have a super high performance, your technique is going to suck and then vice versa. So I would, uh, it, n- not that a sucky performance with great technique is bad because if your proximity to failure is fine, then you're good. But ultimately, you just have to realize they're both on a spectrum that can be manipulated. You want to have your ideal technique and then pick a weight that's appropriate for that. For sure. I feel like I've gone through three phases in this regard. Uh, earlier on, I would try to increase the weight or reps at all costs. And I would just continue to do that. Uh, then kind of phase two was I would still do that. My technique would get worse after, after time. And eventually I would look at myself and say, hey, the technique's not good. Why don't I reduce the, ri- the weight and build back up? So that was kind of like phase two. And now phase three is I'll do my best to make sure that technique's consistent. And if I feel like it wasn't on a specific rep, I will like highlight it in my spreadsheet and then I'll just try to repeat that exact same rep and load next time with better technique. So I feel really good about it before progressing. Um, I'm just wondering if that resonates with either of you. Yeah, I think that um, I think with all that, I have been through that too. those kind of same phases. I like to you've talked about it, Landon. Uh, Barbell Medicine brought it to my attention with an article they wrote uh, a few years ago. But ref- rather than f- referring to it as progressive overload, ref- referring to it as progressive loading. So if I was to do 225 pounds for whatever lift for the same amount of reps four weeks in a row, that's not to say it's a total wash and it's a waste of time. You are still stimulating something, uh, whether it's strength or muscle building or hypertrophy. Um so it's not just a total waste of time because you're not adding reps or weight every session. Um, and progressive loading just refers to the idea that you are, rather than I've done 225, now I have to do 230 in order to get stronger. You do 25, you are now stronger because you've done 225 and you can now display that by doing 230, that you are stronger. So it's like the chicken and the egg, which comes first. Um, and there are some trains of thought that that you have to actually do 230 in order to force adaptation, um, which could be true in some senses. But doing 225 repeatedly uh, will get you stronger or bigger or whatever the goal is. And now you are able to display that increase in size or strength or whatever uh, it is. Um, so progressive, the progression comes first before the test, in a sense. Um but one thing I wanted to mention, uh, Varun, to what you were saying, really what we've been talking about, I do think that it is, I do think metrics are important. I wouldn't want anyone to think that weight on the bar doesn't matter, reps don't matter, because they're often when I work with people, especially in person, because I can see it with my own two eyes, there are times when I'll tell them, uh, okay, it's time to go up in dumbbells, or it's time to go to the next set of uh, preloaded bars, whatever it is. Um, we're doing 60 over and over. It's time to push to 70. And even if you get a few reps left less, that's okay. Um, so it is important to chase metrics in a sense or chase some weight in a sense. And there's nothing wrong with being competitive with yourself and saying, I really want to get this. It's just being honest with yourself. And yes, I got another rep, but my butt was, you know, six inches off the bench. Uh, maybe that wasn't a good rep to my standard. Um, so it is good to push and there, we do have to measure, if we're talking about strength, we do have to measure it in some way. So I can't say if I did 225 for five, okay, now you did 225 for six. I'm not just going to say, well, you probably just you know use different technique and that's why. Maybe you did improve your strength. And it's the same with bodybuilding. I feel like over the past year, I'm bigger. Well, are you? Or maybe is the lighting better? Uh, maybe you're just lower body fat and you look bigger. Like you could do that all day, you know? So I do think that metrics are important and it's okay to chase those. Uh, 
just again, the overarching theme is don't don't lie to yourself. Uh, you know deep down whether or not you earn that progress or not. Yeah, just to add kind of one quick thing to that, I would say it's almost it's beneficial in my opinion to view progressive overload. I mean, there, I think there is a legit debate for whether it is the chicken or the egg, or if it's just these two things that feed off of each other. But if you take the perspective of your training stimulus, so what you do in isolation in one specific session is what causes progressive overload that ultimately will lead to better progressive overload in my personal opinion, because you're focused on hammering home on that muscle. You're trying to not not like tear the muscle down and build it back up like how people used to say 10 20 years ago but you're stimulating that muscle you're getting all the muscle fibers activated and you're doing whatever you can to smoke that muscle you're not worried about performance but what happens when you focus too much on performance is you start to skip around and kind of work your way around the harder more potent parts of that lift so whether that's bouncing out of the stretch or something as simple as that, or using a little bit of cheat technique. And of course, there's a time and place for those. So I'm not going to write those off for everything across the board. But when you focus on your stimulus, ultimately, that's what builds muscle. And that's what will allow you to get another good rep or add another five pounds with relative ease. Uh, and ultimately, that will not just... Like it might it might not let you get the fastest progression progression in the short term, like from this week to next or two weeks from now, but in the long term, like if you're just looking at monthly rates of progression on average weight that you could potentially use or your average reps and how much they increase each month, I think training like that will ultimately give you more progressive overload because one, you're refining your technique even more since it's the same thing time over time. And two, you're stimulating the target muscle as much as you can. And of course, having a big muscle will lead to, to much more force output, AKA strength. So that reminds me of w- what you just said, reminds me of something that I was going through for a couple of years with strong, uh, with strongman and powerlifting. But I would have this base level, just to like be broad about it. I have this base level of strength and I would always peak really, really hard to display some new PR. I, would peak really hard and squat 500 for five reps peak really hard and deadlift 600 pounds as if to think that that's my new kind of base level of strength. But the truth was after those peaks in strength, I was really beat up. I was mentally exhausted and just kind of checked out of that peak and everything would drop back down to the base level. And I would do this year after year after year and have all these really high peaks Uh, not really making any true progress. Um, Just almost as if, hey, I could squat 500 for five. Yeah, I could. One time, never did it again. (laughs) I could squat 600, I could deadlift 600. Two weeks later, I couldn't do it at the powerlifting meet and I never did it after that. So it was like this realization that none of this is really sustainable. And it's kind of the same thing that you were just mentioning. Um, But yeah, I just kind of wanted to take an approach where where can I just raise my base level and kind of, hang out there and then peak when I need to. Um, so same, same sort of concept. Uh, That's in, exactly, in a sense, what it is. Yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. Great example. And if, if you want to, for any bodybuilders out there, you can say the same thing applies to the guys that uh, get to like the early intermediate stage and they compete once or twice a year and they never bulk for more than three months at a time. And they're never going to gain body fat because they're always within striking distance of a show. So it's like, it's kind of that same concept where, yeah, you're, you have a base and it's not as good as it could be, but you just want to compete and show how lean you can get every six months or whatever. So you're never allowing your base to get up. So yeah, I would say that's a probably a very good example, Alan. Yeah. Uh, Alan, you were talking about like not lying to yourself. And I feel like that's such a good gauge, um, not just in terms of things like your technique, but also understanding what personality type you are. So I feel like there's a, there's a challenge here because we want to speak to the person who will almost do anything to increase weight and rep. Like they have that mentality that they're want to push hard. So for those people, they almost need to like tone it down, really be critical of their technique, make sure that they're doing things effectively. But then there's this whole other side of people who are listening and they're just not working hard enough. And I don't want them to use this as a reason to not work harder where they really should be pushing themselves. And I feel like that's this challenging thing when you're trying to do messaging because and I think that's why if you're listening you need to be honest with yourself like which person are you are you the person that's going 
too hard and pushing yourself because you want it so bad and then you need to maybe rein things in? Or are you the person who's looking for every reason to not progress um, and add weight to the bar? Yeah, I think that that's kind of sort of sums up my my recent approach to content. Um, there was a time when I just wanted to teach, like, this is what you need to do. This is what you should do. This is how to do it. Um, whereas now I try to just kind of share experience or something I'm going through and maybe it'll speak to someone. And I think that's what this podcast, uh, it would probably do best. It's not necessarily bullet pointed advice. It's more like it might speak to someone. It might resonate to someone and they say, I understand what they're talking about. It's a good way to frame it, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, it, like you said, you don't want to send mixed messages. Um, but I think people who understand what we're saying or, or can relate in some way could benefit most. Cool. Lane, anything to add? Yeah. Um, I would say I, I've always taken an approach of like the, or I guess the way I make my content is it's very niche and I'm, I thought it was going to be so niche that I'm surprised I even have 25,000 subscribers or whatever I have. Like <laughs> I thought it would always be like this tiny little channel with maybe 10 people that are like minded to me that follow my stuff or whatever. Like it, it was kind of just for fun, but the, the, approach that I had as far as content goes is I was like, this whole industry is catering to the lowest common denominator, and they're not doing it properly. So you have an entire bodybuilding industry of influencers that know a lot of stuff, at least a good amount of them, a lot of influencers suck too, let's be honest. But it, like, I, I, I was an intermediate serious lifter trying to learn as much as I possibly could. And anytime I'd watch a video or look at someone's page or whatever, all the or, or even just ask for advice or talk about advice in like comments on a video or Instagram post or something, it was always everyone just catered to the people that didn't take training seriously because they're the people that need the most advice. So mm -hmm. I'm like, there's clearly a, a gap in the quote unquote market or the space or whatever you want to call it, where there's people like myself that don't want to be told for the 950th time that you just have to train harder. And that's the difference between someone like Alan, who's coming at it from a perspective of, well, if, if I can get them to relate to me, and they can have this moment that clicks with them, then maybe that will help them. Because a lot of these people, if you tell them to train harder, it goes in one ear out the other because they're not serious lifters. So when they have that kind of aha moment or a moment that inspires them when they see somebody that they're interested in or passionate about as far as like being a role model for them as far as lifting goes, uh, th those people might actually have that moment that they suddenly kind of switch into a more serious lifter and realize they want to take it more seriously. So I was very sick of the whole fitness industry, just catering to the people that didn't care about lifting. I felt like people like myself, where we had all this passion for lifting, we dedicated our lives to it. It's still fairly niche. I'm not denying that. But there, it, there it's like there was no channel for people like me. So that's exactly why I made my channel. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm actually going to throw out a quote that Alan, you said a long time ago regarding this, and I think it's kind of right on point. And it was, you have to ask yourself, why should anyone come to your channel? What does your channel have that others do not? At first, nobody cares. You need to figure out what you're giving them. It could be content. It could be entertainment. It could be a bit of both. Um, and I feel like what a lot of people who start YouTube or Instagram, they think like they, they're like, well, I'm a cool personality and I have a good physique. Um, and I feel like that's one way to go about it, but I don't think that's the only way you can go about it. I think you need to have something unique and a differentiator. So like for myself, for example, when I started doing YouTube, I was like, I'm going to do more research than other people. And that's going to be kind of my unique point of view, right? Like I'm not going to come in here and say I'm the most Jack person or I have the highest understanding of, uh, fitness, but it's like. I'm a normal guy. I'm overweight. I've been successful in other areas. And I think I can get the best out of some of my guests. So like that was kind of my unique uh, point of view. So just curious, do you guys feel that, you know, that's why your channels are successful, that you guys did something different? I think well, to answer that question, why my channel would be successful, I think a lot of it is, a lot of it is and was timing of the type of content I was making at the time. I started the channel in, two, I think my first video was 2011. And then I started 
making actual videos for people in 2013 or 2014. And so that was like a big boom in instructional videos and powerlifting and like sharing advice and knowledge and tutorials. So there was a huge time when like Johnny Candido, Omar Isaf, that whole time. Um, <clears throat> so I think that that's what got things really, really popular. Like I, I, uh, I won't go too into it, but when I posted a, my first how to squat video, um, overnight, it was like, uh, thousands, over 5,000 subscribers just from that video. Um, that would never happen now. Uh, so I think a lot of it was for me, like the popular channel was timing. Um, but as far as what did you, what did you ask prior to that? Uh, oh, about, oh yeah, yeah. So, so an, another thing I was going to say about, uh, uh, content, I think that what's unfortunate is nowadays, this is with, with business, not just with fitness, YouTube content. Um, but I think that a lot of people have their, their business or product or service, whatever they're selling online. And so they know, well, now I have to do this Instagram thing and now I have to do this, this, uh, TikTok and YouTube thing. And so they just, well, what's everyone else doing? I'll just do that. Um, and you just get so wiped out. Uh, it's just replicating the same thing that everyone else is doing. So yeah, you have to stand out in some way. I read a book years ago before I opened the gym called the purple cow. Uh, and it's a marketing book. Seth Godin, I think is who wrote it. And it's basically the, the, it's basically if he was, he was like driving through France and he saw, uh, cows everywhere, all over the side of the highway. And he said something like if one of those cows was purple, they would stand out, something like that. So you have to like set yourself out, set yourself uh, uh, in front or make yourself different in some way. Um, and I think that's what really uh, caters to a lot of people or caters to the right people. And so like you had mentioned, Landon, with your channel being really niche, uh, I think that works rather than just having making another super broad general channel. If you guys listen to Will Rattel, he, he often uses these two examples, like when he talks about his content, um, because his, his Instagram, uh, has grown a lot in the past couple of years. And so he, and, you know, he's going to get the question, how do you grow your Instagram? And, uh, he was like, I don't want to be, I don't want to post. I, I want to ask myself, is this content really helping people or am I just regurgitating other stuff? And he says, I don't want to be the guy who says for the millionth time, you should get eight hours of sleep a night or here's five tips or, or five benefits of taking creatine monohydrate. He's just like, we know you don't have to tell us. Uh, <laughs> so he just has to ask himself, like, is this really providing value or am I just posting it just to post it? Um, so anyways, that response was all over the place. I don't even know if it answered your question, but yeah, there were good tidbits thoughts. in there. I'd say, yeah, I, I don't know if I even had a, a question. It was more just the, observation and to get your guys thoughts yeah yeah um so if we're talking about like channel my or i guess my channel or my philosophy behind the content i would say my channel why well, i appreciate you calling it successful it's very kind it is still a very small channel kind of in its infancy but i would say it's successful because of other people other content creators that have been extremely generous in giving my channel a shout out, hosting me for a podcast, uh, commenting, mentioning me, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, there's a million people I could shout out and I'm not going to do that now, but there, yeah, I mean, people, yeah, people like Alex Leonidas, Steve Shaw, um, Alan, obviously huge impact, natural hypertrophy, Jeffrey, all these guys. Uh, and there's a, there's a ton more, so I don't want to list a bunch of people and forget people, but I would say the reason why it's probably remained successful, because obviously if you get a shout out, like, cool, but if people don't like the channel and it's just the creators that like it, it's not going to work. But the reason why it's remained successful, I would say, aside from my very outgoing personality and my high production quality and nice cameras, I would say it's probably just because I, I only film videos that I want to film and I refuse to film anything I do not want to talk about. I'll do Q and A's and I enjoy doing Q and A's, even if I don't find the questions interesting, because it's a direct way that I can talk to people that follow the channel. So that in itself is very interesting. But if someone has like a video request and I don't want to film it, like, sorry, I'm not filming it. It's, it's not out of disrespect to you. It's like, I'm not going to put out a video that I'm not passionate during. Um, so I would say it's talking about things that 
I care about talking about things that have misled me that I have a chip on my shoulder to debunk or provide a counterpoint to. Um, and I just, I don't change who I am. Like, obviously it's just my bodybuilding channel. You're not seeing the person that I am the rest of the time. I don't even know if you'd want to I'm rather boring. Uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say it's just kind of re remaining myself and talking about what I want to talk about. And I, I, distance myself from other people not in terms of like interacting with them but in terms of copying their content i think alan your point about will just making content that he wants to and not just copying other people is huge and i i try and talk about things that other people don't talk about or maybe don't think about i question everything and i think a ton uh it's to a fault i would say but it does make for interesting content and concepts i think for sure I think I that, think, sorry go ahead alan i i think that uh, when you make content that you want to make that you're passionate about, or you have something to say, or you just like getting something off your chest, when you have make content that you like and nobody else likes it, at least you like it. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're making content that you don't like making because you think you need to, and it's not getting watched, you, neither you like it nor the person that it's intended for. So at least making content you only want to make, you can ensure at least I like making it. So that's good. That's good to follow, I think. Yeah, not not to interrupt Varun, but I have a quick question for Alan. So how do you, you've had your channel forever. I mean, it's probably been, what, 12 years or so? I, I can't remember exactly when you started your channel, but like, how do you deal with evolving as a person or evolving your goals, but the the followers that you have are potentially still interested in the same thing that they kind of signed up for if that makes sense like you switched to bodybuilding a, a year ago or so and you started off with powerlifting strongman like how my channel's in its infancy like i haven't gone through that yet so like how do you manage that and how do you tie everything into one specific or, or under one channel i guess i truly don't care uh that would be first answer. and foremost yeah love it i uh I, just like we were just like i said I always make videos based on what I want to make and uh, what I feel inspired by at that time, what I have to talk about. Um, I haven't made that many videos in the last few months because I haven't had a lot to talk about and I've just been busy. Uh, but I never try to force things like, oh no, I need to get a video a week. What could I think about? What could I, what problem can I create right now? Uh, what could I argue about that doesn't need to be argued about? Uh, I never want to do that. And so I truly make videos based on what I want to make. Uh, and I don't really care how it's received. Um, there was a time when I, when I first started natural hypertrophies program, there was probably like, I don't know, five videos that were like pretty long bodybuilding videos. Cause I just had all this stuff to say about it. And I made that. And then it kind of stopped. Like once I'm done trying to get all this off my chest or everything out of my brain, then it's done. Uh, if I have something else that pops up, I'll post about it. Um, but yeah, there are questions when I when I make five bodybuilding videos in a row and then another body another video about something unrelated to bodybuilding, people will ask me like, "You still bodybuilding?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm just not talking about it as much." Um, so that's the answer. I just I truly don't care, and I just will post based on things that that I want to post about. Um, yeah, I can't tell you how many times I was asked, "Oh, you know, did you did you take a, a hit in business when you?" cut your hair and your beard. Cause that was like your thing. That was like, you probably let a bunch of people down. And I'm like, you really think I'm going to keep my hair and beard because other people want me to have that. It's just so silly. Like I can't, there, I would never live like that. There's a lot of so, people that would though. Like there's a lot of people that care so much about like branding and yeah. image and like i don't know do you actually like the watch you're wearing or is it like someone else told you it's a cool watch so you spent 30 grand on this watch and you're kind of kind of a knob like yeah. i don't know <laughs> yeah same with losing weight like when i decided i was gonna it was in 2019 when i had my son i i'm gonna drop like 50 pounds and then it was like oh people don't you know they're not gonna recognize you or you're gonna be so different i like what am i gonna hold on to 50 extra pounds and like negatively affect my health and keep stuff in my face because I want to look like a, you know, I want to be a certain person to what people think I need to be. Um, never, never in a million years. And if I do ever feel like that, if I do ever feel like, am I just doing this? Am I just following this bodybuilding routine? Because, you know, I put it out on YouTube and now I have to, and people expect me to, 
if that ever crosses my mind, I'll, I'll immediately just check it out of social media and just think, okay, what if social media didn't exist? Would I still do this? If the answer is no, then I'm not going to do it. Um, and to an extreme, sometimes I'll ask myself, if I was the last person on this earth, would I keep doing this? Uh, if the answer is no, probably not. So, uh, yeah, that's just kind of how I think about it. For an example, I took about a, uh, a good amount of time off of benching cause it kept bothering my pec and my shoulder. Um, and I just, I kept benching, I kept benching, it kept bothering it, kept benching, kept benching, kept bothering it. And then I asked myself, why do I keep benching? Is it just because it's so ingrained in my like powerlifting mentality, or I think I need to, why can't I just do weighted pushups and dips and some machine stuff? I have hammer strength, uh, machines that I could use that don't bother it but I just refused to give up benching. And then I thought, all right, if I was the last person on this earth, would I still be lifting weights? Absolutely. Yes. Would I still be bench pressing? Hell no. I'm just going to stop benching. Uh, and so I did for a period of time. Uh, but it's just stuff like that to where I'll just remove myself from social media and ask, you know, me, what I, should I keep doing this or do I want to do this? And the answers to that is usually the, what I'm going to go with. Yeah, that's interesting. I know both of you talked about like, maybe like motivation becomes a little bit more challenging when you're advanced. Um, I saw some comments around it. I don't know the exact context, but do you feel that even like setting up goals can be more challenging as you get advanced? Like, uh, Landon, I know you're thinking through like, what's kind of the next journey. And kind of my experience has been like, after you achieve a really big goal, uh, so for me, it was like selling my company to Google. Like I kind of forced all these goals, like, hey, this is the next thing. I want to get promoted at Google or I want to do this. And then they all kind of fizzled out because they just didn't feel like authentic to me. Like, so I'm just curious thoughts on like advanced lifting and, and setting up goals. Once you've kind of done all the easy and exciting goals, um, just any thoughts on that, either of you? Um. Yeah, go ahead, Landon. Yeah, I, I would just say I like to pick things that other people have done because in my mind, I have that's proof that I can do it. And I will, I'm a very competitive person in things that I care about. So for 18 of Jarms, I was like, well, other people can do it. So if I can't do it, I'm like a loser and probably toxic mindset wise for some people. But for myself, I'm like, I'm, I'm very, very hard on myself. And I, I, love being like the underdog and proving myself wrong. So that's what motivates me. Uh, if I'm picking something that is like debatably not possible, like maybe if I set my mind on like 19 and a half inch arms, like that wouldn't motivate me because I am realistic with it. Uh, but 18 inches, I was like, that is going to happen. I'm going to do whatever I can possibly do to make that happen. And if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be so pissed off that it's not happening, that that is going to be my motivation to make it happen. So I can pretty much do, I wouldn't say I could do anything I can set my mind to or whatever, because that's dumb. But within reason, I'll make it happen one way or another, I think. So that 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 motivates me. I think that the first thing I'll say is similar to what I talked about with the peaks. I stopped setting really hard goals for myself. Like I, I'm going to squat 500 for five reps because when I was doing that, I was squatting more than I wanted to way more frequency. Than I wanted to, I was kind of like just dragging myself through training sessions. I was eating like a cow trying to gain weight. So I could do that. And then when I hit it, it was like sweet, but then I just kind of dropped back down to baseline. Um, so what I, the way I think about goal setting now, sometimes I will have those short-term goals. For example, I'm going to sign up for California Strongest Man. Uh, that's in three months. I really want to do well. I want to place first place. So then that would be a goal and I would just do my best to, to train for that and compete there. Um, so that would be something. I don't really set, as of right now, I'm not setting any hard goals in the gym as far as I need to get 18 inch arms or I need to squat 500 for this many reps. Uh, because those are some, those are, I wouldn't say they're completely out of my control, but they're somewhat out of my control. What I like to set goals with, and what I think most people should do is set a goal that is 100% in your control. So what I mean is for the next year, I am going to lift weights 
four days, four days a week, whatever it is. I'm going to go to the gym four days a week. And every time I go to the gym, I'm going to try. So things like consistency, effort, those are all in your control. And I kind of just do those the best that I can. And then I play the cards that I'm dealt from there. Uh, and that's kind of how I view the gym right now. I would say above all else, I just love going to the gym. So I'm always going to, but I really take pride in, I have not, my consistency has been perfect. I haven't missed a session in X amount of years, right? Uh, I always try in the gym. I never half-ass it. Some things might adjust a little bit based on time or scheduling, uh, but I'm never skipping things and I'm never just going through the motions. Even if it's a bad workout, I still tried. I just don't have much to try, much juice to try with. Um, so anyways, those are in my control, those certain things. And I just try to set that sort of goal. I want to be consistent for the next, whatever, six months, not miss a session. I want to actually try my best. So I think that that's better than saying I need to, you know, bench 225 times 10 by the end of the year. Again, that's not, some people are wired that way and that's okay to do. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I would never tell someone not to do that. But uh, once you feel like, well, I'm not getting there as fast as I should be, or maybe it's a little bit out of my reach. For me, it just kind of sucks the fun out of training. And uh, I can't stand, I can't stand seeing people go to the gym who hate going to the gym. Uh, it's, it's not me. I want to enjoy it. And I think that that's part of the reason why, you know, over the past five years, there's been like some powerlifting, some strongman, some bodybuilding, uh, some running, some calisthenic stuff. It's just incorporating more things to uh, increase my uh, adherence to my own program. Yeah, I really like that with the process oriented goals almost like when, uh, whenever I'm cutting, what I actually just track is like, okay, my goal is to track my food and my fitness pal for the next 100 days. Like that's literally my goal. And then I just check it off if I did it. I don't even care if I'm under my calorie target every day. I just know that if I track it for 100 days, the odds are I'm going to directionally go in the right direction. But then there's a part of me that really likes those big, scary goals that are kind of exciting and make me anxious as well. So it's always kind of figuring out, because if I just do the process-oriented goal, like it's fun, but sometimes I like that thing where I'm almost scared of it, where I'm like, can I do this? And then I have to push towards it. So I feel like having both goals, depending on your personality type, can be good. Yeah, I, would I say, think that uh, with regards to diet, just really quick, I, uh, you know, it, rather than saying I want to lose 10 pounds by this time, you might say something like, uh, yeah, I drink a lot of liquid calories, whatever, a lot of soda, a lot of juice. I'm just going to stop drinking liquid calories. I am in complete control of that. Uh, I'm going to stop eating ice cream, whatever it is, um, just things that are tangible that you have total control of. And then at the end of that, a couple of months, we'll see where I'm at, see what kind of see what kind of a uh, dent that makes in my goal, I think is an easier way to go about setting goals. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I would say it, it's almost like what I kind of try and explain to people sometimes with that whole concept is like, once you start to see results that almost builds motivation intrinsically. So it's like if, if instead of having like setting your first goal of losing 10 pounds to be that first goal, it's hard to get over that first hump. But if you set something like, oh, well, I'm going to track my macros or track my calories every day, like you said, Varun, then it's like, all right, well, that's an objective thing you can commit to. And it has a limited amount of time, you, two months or whatever you can commit to. Odds are throughout that process, you lose 10 pounds. And then you're like, oh, well, that worked. And now I see progress that kind of motivates me. The one thing I, that I wanted to add to this was, I would say as far as like goal setting for myself, I, I try and practice almost like, I wouldn't say like a deeper level of discipline, but I guess a different type of discipline than what most people talk about as far as like the gym goes. Like we're, we're all serious lifters. So we've had various people come up to us that maybe don't lift and they go, oh, your discipline is insane. How do you go to the gym four or five days a week, whatever. And I would say that is very disciplined. But what I would also say is when people said that to me and they were like, oh, you have excellent discipline for lifting six days a week. Like, I don't know how you do it. For me, I'm like, I appreciate the compliment, but it really isn't discipline because I'm so emotionally tied to that goal that it's really just endless motivation. And I haven't even thought about not going to the gym for a day because I'm so obsessed with it. 
and that's just that's just who I am. So that's not really discipline that I'm overriding by a desire to sit on the couch and not go to the gym. The real discipline that I find is like setting a goal, like whatever it is, 18 or 19 inch arms. The real discipline that, that where I find people get knocked off track entirely is when they set a goal like that. And then one little thing goes wrong, they spiral down. So if their measurements go down, do they lose a rep or whatnot? They question everything. The real discipline is being able to kind of sit through a time like that and be able to balance being so emotionally invested in a goal and being able to take those hits that would normally knock people off track. So it's being able to I'm sorry. not take those hits and have it ruin your t emotional attachment to that goal. It's being able to remain as emotionally attached, but not let it knock you off track and, and basically cut that emotional attachment in half. So that's what I view as like probably real discipline. Yeah. And you see that all the time with weight loss where someone goes on the scale and they're up three pounds and they say they've been doing everything right. And then they just completely fall off. Mm -hmm. And that's why I feel like having that big goal and the process goal together is nice. Because if you don't have the big goal, let's say you're more of a beginner and intermediate, like you can't have someone new in the gym and just say, okay, your goal is going to be to go to the gym three times a week. It's like almost not exciting enough for them to build that identity. It's easier for the two of you because you guys are lifters. That's what you imagine, especially like Alan, you can focus on that. You've been doing it for so long. Like it's not even a question, right? Um, so I feel like having that process goal is good because it can keep you on track when those days go bad. Cause you're like, I'm still doing the right thing. So I know I'm in the right direction. But you do kind of sometimes need that big, exciting goal to like be emotionally attached to it and be more likely to kind of push through. So I feel I don't have a good answer here, but I feel like having both is nice. Yeah. And it's kind of an example with what you've been going through recently, Landon. If you were to, it can keep you honest to say, okay, I'm on the road to 18 inch arms and I'm going to uh, post a measurement every week, uh, weekly measurements, um, just to one, keep yourself honest. To two, have some transparency on your videos. To like, hey, this is the kind of progress. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. So I think that that's all, that's all fine and well. Uh, and it's important. And again, but it, it just goes back to your personality. That kind of stuff motivates you. Um, whereas it's not necessary for all, all goals to, to track like that. But sometimes it is certainly necessary. And it's the same. I guess maybe it's a little more important when you're somewhat advanced. So if I was with a, a track athlete and we're like, we got to get your 100 meter dash from 10.5 to 10.3, um, we're probably going to track a number of metrics to see if what we're doing is working, if we're going in the right direction, um, rather than just saying, hey, you know, don't worry about it, just show up to practice and run hard, you know, um, so it's important to a point, but maybe not for the majority of people. Yeah, it's, a, it's very individual because it's obviously very much so tied into psychology. <laughs> I guess if I could just kind of summarize the way I view it, especially when I was younger and still kind of now to this point, it's like, like if you've seen that other people can do these things, like, are you just going to accept that you are stuck, miserable, not at that goal because little things knock you off track and you don't have the emotional capacity to override those negative feelings? Like, I'm not saying everybody has to be like this perfect stoic person or whatever, but I don't know. Uh, do you like, do people not get fired up enough about that? Do you not let yourself get motivated and get that chip on your shoulder to go achieve something that you genuinely want? Because you always come back to it. It's like, if you're someone that wants to say, get jacked or lose weight, e either one is kind of an extreme overall transformation. If you're depending on where you're starting from, like you, you know, you want it. And that feeling isn't going to go away no matter how much you try and like ignore it and kind of shove it in the back of your head. So I, I just think at some point you have to kind of say, like, why am I stuck as this person that doesn't have motivation or falls for all these little traps in the process? Like, I'm sick of being like that. I'm sick of it being easy for everybody else except me. So I'm going to prove myself wrong and go make it happen, regardless of how difficult it is, regardless of what I have to do. I don't care. I'm going to make it happen. And I think there's sometimes there that like relentless feeling probably isn't talked about quite enough because I, I think everybody has the capacity to probably make that happen. A lot of it's probably just genetic based on your own psychology and your environmental 
situation and in the way you grew up. But I think everybody has the capacity to kind of develop that mindset. Yeah. It's empowering lifting weights and getting better and improving body composition. All that stuff is empowering. So that's mm-hmm. why we stick with it. I think, cause we've felt the effects of that. I agree. Yeah. hundred mm-hmm. percent agree. Yeah. I think the challenge is some people have really negative self-talk. So they're just talking to themselves all day being like, you're skinny, you're a loser, you're fat. And you need a certain amount of willpower to kind of push through that and then get some wins. And once you have some wins, you can kind of like feed off those wins. But like a lot of people don't make it to the wins that they now have something positive to relate to. It keeps getting to the like, you're fat, you're skinny, you know, you're out of shape, you're not strong. And they push and then that keeps coming up. And then they go back to the beginning of the cycle and then they try it again in six months you have to kind of get to a certain spot where you have some wins that you can say, Hey, I see, I see that I'm moving in this direction. And I feel like people don't even get there. Yeah. I would say even like if you take kind of the wins aside, I would say long-term, that's probably the the way to go is to be motivated for like a positive goal that makes you feel good. But do you like, I, I could just be different. Like I, I believe that everybody is a little bit different just based on the situation that you grew up in or the situation you live in or whatnot. But like if you guys had that kind of mindset where it's like, oh, I, I hate myself. I'm super skinny or super fat or super weak or whatever it is that you hate about yourself. Like, does that not motivate you to say like, why, why am I stuck with this brain that tries to bring me down and kind of destroy me by saying all these little things and doubting every little thing and like, why did I get stuck in this situation? And that's almost like the motivation to like, get out of that area. And you see that all the time where like the person that grew up poor is like somehow the best athlete or somehow became a millionaire or whatever. And it's like, does everybody have the capacity to develop that type of self-talk or that type of motivation? Or is that just for a select few amount of people? I think, I think it's, I have to tell myself that uh this person i don't know if you can hear my dog she's going crazy yeah, right bit. now it's cool let me uh <laughs> toss something at her she's having crazy dreams oh <laughs> uh, it works. but yeah everyone is uh uh everyone is different uh and i have to remind myself even when working with people in person uh this person is different than i am they don't think like i do and so I can't expect necessarily the same thing that I expect for myself. And it's the same with uh, relationships. Um, it's easy to say, why do they act like that? Why do they respond like that? Like this, this, and this, it, this is the fact. Uh, I'm okay with it. Why are they not okay with it? Or why does this bother them so much? It's not that big of a deal. It's just mm-hmm. understanding that, yeah, people are different. And I'm not saying you have to be like, make a bunch of excuses for people or be totally sympathetic of everyone or not to expect other people, not to expect better from other people. Um, But I just kind of think of it like that. Like when I'm talking to people in person uh, for personal training, I'm just, whether it's their past experiences or what they're telling themselves, um, I just realize like, wow, we do not think alike. Uh, And that's, that's, uh, it is what it is. Like I can, try to kind of offer my tidbit and uh it might persuade them a little bit but at the end of the day yeah they're just not wired the same way that i am and vice versa so yeah that that's kind of the beauty of training is it's like striking that happy medium of when to of, of figuring out when something is an excuse from somebody and when something is like a genuine feeling that somebody has that they can't exactly just ignore. And I, I think it's almost kind of a, a fun thing to help people overcome stuff like that. And, and ultimately that's kind of what training is aside from like the technical uh, programming technique, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. We're all different. I get told pretty constantly from my family that I'm a robot because I'm very like logical and I'm not, overly emotional and i'm always just trying to solve problems and people are like i'm just trying to talk i'm not trying to solve problems and i'm like i'm doing it again where i'm like oh yeah here's the seven steps you need to take let's spreadsheet it let's do it and they're like we're not trying to solve this problem i'm like shit i'm doing it again (laughs) Uh, anyways uh, i'm gonna throw out some topics tell me if it's underrated or overrated and uh, first one, I want Landon to go first because uh, we may have differences in opinions here. Calisthenics. 
Uh, calisthenics, I would say, so it totally depends on the niche you're in. If you're in the natural bodybuilding niche that I involve myself in, I think it's overrated. Why? Because people overrate it. Because people say, oh, the best physiques are the guys in calisthenics. It's not true. It's not true. They're jacked and they look great, but it just objectively isn't true. The top natural bodybuilders, aka the biggest natural lifters that exist, all train like bodybuilders. They're all using machines. They're all doing hack squats. They're all doing, they're all using Cybex and prime machines and barbells and doing RDLs and SLDLs and this kind of stuff and preacher curls, JM presses, all that kind of stuff. Those are less common, but they're very good lifts. I, I always have to promote them at least a little bit. I like how you had to say JM press. Like I had to sneak it in there. <laughs> I, had, I, I can't, I, I, I don't really have control over it. It just kind of comes out. <laughs> so I would say, I would say it's overrated overall. Uh, but it, it's still it's still very good, and I would also say it's I would I would go as far as to say it's almost underrated in like the more mainstream fitness industry. Okay. But in w- where I spend my time, I would say it's overrated. People think pull ups and dips are somehow magical because their body weight and your body can take its natural path or whatever. Um, I would say there are some like small perks to that, but they're not like better objectively for building muscle because of reasons like that. All right, I'm going to give my two cents and I'll let Alan go. So I think weighted chin-ups and pull-ups specifically are a great exercise because it forces you to not get too fat. And I think there's a huge advantage for that. I also think if you're cutting, it's a fantastic exercise because you can progress while you're cutting, which is a lot harder to do for other exercises. And I understand the total weight might not be but just the idea that you're still moving, adding weight to the bar, uh, per se, I think has a, a great advantage. Um, but like, you know, technically, sure, maybe it's like less stable than if you're doing like a lap pull down or something like that. But I think that exercise specifically is really good. You can add weight to it and you won't delude yourself into thinking that your bulk is going well. Because you'll know if you're not putting on strength in that exercise when you're bulking. So I feel like it has a, a really good way for your body composition to, to stay in check if you have a problem with that. Yes, I agree. That's definitely a, I, I would say, somewhat unique use for it, where if you're somebody that's experienced and you've bulked and cut a bunch of times, you know how to do it properly, probably not as useful. But if you're someone that is prone to like dirty bulking or something, yeah, that's a that's a very underrated point, I would say, Rune. That's a good one. I like that. Awesome. Alan, any thoughts? Yeah, I would say that calisthenics would be, I think, overrated as a necessity, like you had just mentioned with for bodybuilding. Um and maybe for for like powerlifting. So just again, depends on the concept context. But I think that uh, it's underrated for its its utility. Um, I think that dips and push-ups and pull-ups, you can get so much productive work in. Aside from low, lower body training, you can get a lot of really, really good work in with calisthenics training. And I'll even find myself sometimes, um, if I'm doing a uh, workout in my garage, I have some stuff in my garage and I'm doing, or at the gym, but I'm doing dips, weighted dips, or I'm doing weighted push-ups with a backpack that I have. Sometimes I get into a groove and I'm like, I'm just going to stick with this and really push this. So for example, I might have, like I had a deficit uh, weighted push-ups that I was doing and they were feeling really good. I was supposed to do three sets. And then afterwards I was going to do three sets of a chest press. Uh, and I said, I'm just not going to do the chest press. I'm just going to knock out six hard rep, hard sets on this because I just, I was just in a groove and it felt really good. But again, I think that comes down to the individual. If you enjoy doing it, calisthenics, if I was as a, a personal trainer, I almost never use it with most of my, my clients. Um, it is, I do work with like general population most of the time and they're either extremely weak. And so I'm not going to have them get up there and struggle to do a pull up, um, or they're extremely overweight. And so a barbell is much easier to scale pair of dumbbells is much easier to scale. So they're going to get a lot more work in through a barbell, a machine or a dumbbell. Um, and then on top of that, I have to sort of uh, as a personal trainer, show my worth. So uh, if I if someone comes in, I'm like, hey, man, we're just going to do push-ups. 
uh, this whole session, push ups, some sit ups, um, whatever, some burpees and uh, some pull ups. Uh, like I can't help but think in the back of their head, they're like, okay, well, I could just do this in my house. You know, I actually need you to show me how to use some gym stuff. Um, so again, uh, not necessary, but I think that the utility of it is underrated, especially during COVID when people are like, I don't have a gym, a fully equipped gym. Like you can, you can get a lot of really, really good training in, uh, with just doing calisthenics aside from lower body, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I maybe like it- dense, well, and maybe like lower back stuff. Uh, you can certainly do lats and upper back, but I don't know if we're breaking down muscle groups, lower body, lower back. Maybe, I, maybe not. I don't think it can be the, like I'm saying weighted pull-ups or chin-ups. It's, it's not the only exercise you're doing. I'm still doing a ton of rows and other things as well. Lap pull-downs for more volume. So I think it's part of a program. It, it shouldn't be the entire program by any means. It's not really going to build too much back thickness. I think it just straight comes down to personal preference. Mm-hmm. Some people really just love barbells. Some people love machines. Some people love a little bit of everything. Some people love calisthenics. And I have recently been more on the side of, I would rather do barbell stuff and calisthenics weighted than machines. Alan, is a, is a squat a weighted calisthenic? <laughs> yeah, right? If you're doing, yeah, weighted <laughs> You know what I mean? You're, squat, you're, you're right? moving through space. I always wonder, it's like, yeah. is that just a weighted calisthenic, yeah. but we don't a want to talk about a, it a because of the barbell? A, yeah, deadlift <laughs> is a weighted pickup. Um, yeah, we can all <laughs> consider that. Yeah. All right. Um, next one, uh, overrated, underrated, or you can do fairly rated specialization phase for hypertrophy. Oh, that's you a tricky Don't one. Ask me. I would say I, they don't, it wouldn't stick out to me as underrated or overrated. So I think this would be an appropriate time for, uh, appropriately rated. I think, <sighs> I, yeah, I, I don't have any crazy thoughts on this. And I would say a, a lot of people do it wrong by not committing to it. I think a lot of people focus, they put all their attention on the shiny new object of being able to specialize in a muscle, but they almost kind of overlook or forget about the rest of the body. And usually us humans with shiny new object syndrome, when you start focusing on the arms and your bench stalls out, your head kind of turns this way. You're like, Hmm, all right, I should probably focus on this too. And then your deadlift starts to go down or your legs shrink or your shoulders aren't looking as good as they used to be, or you stalled out on growth there. And then it just, I find a lot of people that want to do specialization phases always revert their way back into regular training, just regular, good old bodybuilding. But they, um, they, they don't commit to a specialization phase and accept the fact that some muscles have to maintain if you want to prioritize other muscles, whether it's physically and objectively in your program or it's just psychologically. If you're putting all your all your eggs in the basket of trying to grow your arms as much as possible, everything else isn't as fun in comparison. So you might but you might not be training it as optimally or as hard or whatever. So I, I would say overall they're pretty pretty appropriately rated. I have nothing. No, I have no comment. That's not my area of expertise. Um, and I don't know if I would ever worry too much about specialization for hypertrophy for me personally. Um, even when I did, when I was doing uh, natural hypertrophies program, I wasn't uh, sure there were things like, Hey, I could probably like really increase the size of my arms, but there was nothing where I was like, I need to bring up my, uh, uh my sh- caps on my shoulders and my lower body is pretty developed. So I need to do less of that to bring up, to make this, um, uh, proportional. I've never worried about any of that. Um, I pretty much just did bodybuilding was doing it and still am somewhat, uh, just cause I enjoy the routine, but I, I specialization. That, I, no that's comment. a good question for you guys. Do you, do either of you have like an ideal physique that you're going towards? Not anymore. I mean, when I first started, there would be a few like kind of general ideas of what I wanted to look like, but the more I grow, the more I realize that I'm just going to, I really am just going to look like what I end up looking like. And while you can, you can buy a certain muscles and develop a certain look for your physique. It's like, I wouldn't say there's a specific goal physique that I have. There just hasn't been one that I've had for a very, very long time since like my early, early twenties. And I would say now there's like 
a certain look that I want. So like personally, I really like big arms and a big upper back. I don't care that much about my legs. I'm starting to care more about my calves. Uh, and then I think delts are cool too. Chest is kind of cool. Abs and legs lower priority. Uh, not specifically uh, when I first started, not when I first started lifting, but when I first started getting into powerlifting and bulking and strongman, just, I wanted to try to look like Bill Kazmaier and Sven Carlson and Magnus Samuelson. Nice. Uh, but then I realized when I got to 255 that my waist was like over 40 inches. And I was like, man, a lot of this bulking is just going to my fat belly. Um, I'm not growing like those guys. Maybe my bones are different. Uh, but I would say if I had to give an answer, I think more like I strive to look more like a, uh, an NFL mm, linebacker, maybe. That'd be kind of sweet. So I'm not, yeah. Or maybe a rugby player. That would be like a, an ideal physique. But I'm not, I'm not like trying to, you know, adjust my program to accommodate that. But I don't know. I think that along with the athleticism, I think I care more about now. Nice. Um, yeah, I feel like, I think, Landon, you've talked about this in the past, like with the kind of the the spider physique and stuff, where I think people oh, yeah. want, you know, they maybe actually want bigger arms, but then they don't prioritize it. So I feel like if you're earlier in your journey and you want to have a standout muscle, like just go for it. Like don't yeah, listen yeah, yeah. to everyone who says like you need to have a perfectly well-proportioned physique. Like it's your body. No one cares no one's you know what i mean like if you want to be the guy with big arms get big arms if you want to have big traps just crush your traps and try to get big traps like whatever the goal is just go for it and uh don't care about what your favorite influencer wants as their ideal physique i agree i think it's a happy medium approach where you get people that want to have like a they, they want big arms and then they go on instagram tiktok youtube and whatnot and everyone's like all right you want to get big you want to have a good physique get your bench press up. How are your barbell rows doing? Oh, you have to deadlift. You have to do barbell rows. You have to do this deadlift. You have to do barbell rows. How's your overhead press doing? You should do that too. No one's ever like, oh, how's your preacher curl doing? How's your Smith JM press doing? How are your overhead extensions doing? And like, <laughs> it's just unbelievable how much people don't care about certain muscle groups. And I think, I think the reason for that is because you powerlifting and strength training and bodybuilding all get kind of put into one thing. And I think just the nature of each sport draws the more analytic types towards number oriented sports like powerlifting. So that's why the better, more educated and smarter, more articulate people on YouTube are more numbers oriented. Mm -hmm. You could even say someone like Alan, who in the early 2010s, when you started to come up, you had like an objective approach. You understood technique. You're a very smart person versus if you just took a bodybuilder that was explaining things in a bit more of an esoteric way, they're clearly on a bunch of steroids. It's like, how much do you really trust that person? So everybody that is into just the quote unquote lifting sphere uh, ends up following people that have advice that is more so geared towards something like powerlifting, but they don't necessarily understand that. And a power lifter doesn't care as much about getting big in, in most cases, at least like innately. So they're going to be like, Oh, uh, focus on this and, and you'll get big in the process. Yeah. You'll get super jacked, but super jacked for them is half of what a bodybuilder would want. So like when I say, Oh, just yeah, do your Smith bench and your preacher curls. So you'll get crazy strong from that as a side effect of getting jacked. Someone that's into powerlifting is like, no, that's terrible advice. Like I should hyper specialize in bench press since I'm literally competing in that. So I think that's part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely track every lift and I care about every lift, but I, I've been obsessed about like a few years ago when I was trying to build up my delts, I was counting full reps with lateral raises and then I was counting half reps and then I was counting like quarter reps and I had it all in my spreadsheet and I was trying to beat all of it. I got really obsessed with it. So, Oh, um, even I can't bring myself to do that. <laughs> I don't do that anymore, but I was for a while because I was like, how many partials are there? And then after the partials, there's like these like you know, these like 20% reps. I'm like, how many of those did I do? And then I was like, I think I'm over, I'm over counting this at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. So what I want to do is I'm going to end things off with a couple of fun things. First, I'm going to throw a uh, image here on the screen for Landon. Hmm. And uh, I think that's you as a goalie there. 
I, I could be wrong. Yeah. And uh, you have fifteen dollars to spend. Uh, who is your your five in front of you? Knowing that they're all forwards, but you can uh, you can talk through it. Let me enlarge my screen if I can. Uh, so my first one would be the guy on the right with the big picture. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> let's see. So I'm gonna start at I'm gonna start at the one dollars. So you've got Keith Kachuk, you got Madonna, Ronick, and Recky. Oh, I have to go Recky. I'm a Bruins fan. He finished uh, finished his career with the Bees. I would say Solani. I'd go for number two. And oh wait, this is fifteen bucks total. So if I do one, you do whatever you want. You can have multiple guys at five dollars or whatever. Okay, well I'll start with that. So I'll go Recky Solani. So I'm at three bucks. I'll add another three. I'll go. I'm going to go with Forsberg, so I'm getting the right side of these guys. I'm going to go with Korea again. Okay, so I really like the guys on the right side. So we're at 4 plus 5 plus 1. That is 10. Okay, so I can spend a a 5. I would go... I'd have to go Yager. The fact that he has scored a goal in a pro hockey league in Czechia at age 52 is unbelievable. And he also played for the Bruins for a year in 2013, and it was fun to watch him. You, so you're not taking Wayne Gretzky on your team? Uh, no, he didn't play for the Bruins. Can't book him. Look at that bias. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Bobby Orr? Come on. <laughs> awesome. All right, so last time uh, I was chatting with Alan. Um, he told me he did a video for Hot Ones on YouTube, and I actually did something similar uh, with like 10 of my friends. I even got shirts made. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have extremely hot hot sauce. So why don't we go grab that, Alan, and sorry. All, right. All right, let's get this. Good luck, guys. And Landon, you can just laugh at us here because I don't know why we're doing this. I have really bad ideas here. Okay. It says, uh, warning, this hot sauce is extremely hot. Keep at a reach of children. Consume one drop at a time with extreme caution. Um, so last time I had this, I think I hallucinated. Seriously? Yeah, it was, wow. it was, it was a lot and I don't know why I'm doing this again. And, uh, yeah, either. it's, it's just one of those bad ideas and I knew Alan would be game for it. And now we're kind of doing it here. So I think he's going to yeah, go grab his chicken like... breast. I have wings here. Wings. Yeah, I've got chicken breast. Oh, how sweet. much are you putting on this thing? Well, I was just going to say that hum, it says to do one drop. How many drops are we doing? I'll let you pick. One, I think two. just a normal uh, dab like they do on hot ones would be good. All right, let's do one dab yeah, here. Here it is. Oh, I'm not a. Yeah. It's not really the hot that's going in that bothers me. It's the hot that goes out that bothers me. Oh, yeah. It's really... You know what I mean. All right, cheers, man. Uh, let me get started. Oh, you're opening the bottle. Yeah, I got my thing there. This is going to be. And I have. I was telling Landon, I have two new personal training clients right after this. That's that I've never met. It's my first time meeting them, so I'll just look like an idiot if I'm still, uh, if I'm still affected. Yeah, that's a bad idea, man. Just make sure you get one drop. Don't go too crazy. Yeah, that's. Oh, good. what did you do? I did like two drops here. It's not. It's not too crazy. Oh, All, right. Oh, All right. So All right. Cheers, man. All right. Cheers. No, Varun's getting it. Horrible idea. It tastes horrible. <clears throat> How's that compared to the other sauce that you had? Uh, give me a few seconds. That's pretty bad. He looks fine as of now. How long does it normally take to kick in? It's kicked in. Seconds. Oh, I can. Yo, yeah, I can. Take <laughs> <laughs> it did. So last time I did this, my buddy went first. There was eleven of us. He put eight drops on it. We didn't read the label. It was it was a good time. It was a disaster. Yeah, that's pretty bad. All right, I think I'm not going to ask any more questions now. We're probably <laughs> done. So I'll start with uh, Landon. Where can everyone find you? Oh, Basin Bodybuilding on YouTube and Instagram. No other social media. Alan. 
uh, Untamed Strength on Instagram, uh, Untamed Strength on YouTube, and then uh, my website is trainuntamed.com. All right, boys. Thanks for your time. Thanks for yeah, Of course. Here.